Welcome back to LED Live. Have you ever been in a tragic experience and wondered where is God in all of this? Jefferson County 911. Yes, I am a teacher at Columbine High School. There is a student here with a gun. He has shot out a window. Sorry, and I've got every student in this library on the phone. You better stay on the phone. Is there any way you can lock the doors? Well, thank you guys for tuning back in and watching LED Live. And for those of you that are new to this channel, if you like what you see, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We've got a lot of different topics coming out uh, weekly, every single Friday. Um, today's topic is something that is a very special topic. And we have an amazing guest on, on our show today. You guys aren't gonna wanna miss this um, because I think it really illustrates a really deep, deep, thing of sometimes when when all hell breaks loose and and you're in the middle of this absolute disaster it's 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 it could be confusing like where is god why wasn't god there and i think after you hear today's testimony um you will see god is in the very midst of these tragedies many times and so i want to introduce to you guys um daryl scott whose daughter was one of the um, students that lost her life during the Columbine shootings back in 1999. And we are very pleased to have you on the show, Daryl. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's good to be here. Daryl travels around the, the U.S. and gives a lot of talks. Um, I'm sure you'll get a little bit into this. Um, and it has a ministry that really centers around a challenge that your daughter um, had, had presented. And um, it's known as Rachel's Challenge. And so um, tell us a little bit about uh, uh, um, your experience of getting involved in, in this type of work and, and what it is that you actually do. Well, I'll, I'll uh, fast forward beyond the tragedy to something that happened to me at a service station, at a gas station. Uh, a gentleman asked me, he recognized me from television interviews that I've been doing. And he said, uh, he didn't say it in a bad way, but he said, where was God? when your daughter was killed at Columbine. Mm -hmm. And uh, at first I didn't know what to say. And, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit always provides you with an answer if you just are willing to listen. That's right. And I said he was the same place he was when his son died at Calvary. Wow. Mm -hmm. Good answer. And uh, at the time that Rachel died, my, by the way, she was the first victim of the first mass shooting uh, at Columbine. Columbine was the first mass shooting a school shooting, and Rachel was the first of 140 something victims now over the last 21 years. Wow. But uh, Rachel was sitting outside having lunch with one of her friends just outside the school when two boys came over a hill Some kind of prank. in the back of the school and they had trench coats on and they pulled out guns and they opened fire. They wounded dozens of students who were sitting out on the lawn and uh, Rachel was the first one to be shot and killed. And uh, there was a lot of controversy over who said what in the last moments. But we know uh, because the young man who was beside her, uh, Richard Costaldo, who's, who's paralyzed from the waist down, he's in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. But he told us that uh, the gunman lifted Rachel's head by her hair and said, do you still believe in God? And she said, you know, no, I, I do. do. Wow. And then he said, then he'll be with him. Shot her in the temple. And uh, she was the first victim to be killed that day. Wow. But uh, the shock that hit our family, you don't expect uh, to send your child to school and, and have, have them killed. Yeah. And uh, I was in a shopping mall when I got a phone call from my wife saying that there had been a shooting at the school. And I rushed out to, I was going to, I had my truck. I rushed out to my truck and uh, turned on the radio. And the announcer said that up to 30 students had been killed which wasn't true, but there was a lot of turmoil at the time. Uh, 12 students and a teacher died that day. And incidentally, 2000 years earlier, another 12 students and teacher had an impact on the world. Wow, wow. that's interesting. Yeah. Wow. Exactly, 2000 years <laughs> earlier. Yeah. The yeah. first teacher was called the son of David. The teacher killed the Columbines, the name was David. Oh, wow. wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, I, I remember when I heard this story, um, and, and I want you to get into all this, the parallels here 
that have these deeper spiritual like applications. Um, I was blown away at, at at how many things had had popped up that it was almost like 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 God had His hand over this from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And and so you know you're bringing out all these little spiritual connections, but but yeah, definitely expand upon upon that a little bit um, and and tell us about some of those those kind of connections. Well, uh, going back to the teacher, David Sanders was his name. Uh, David was, uh, was trying, he laid down his life for his students that day. And of course, we know that Jesus did the same thing. He mm. laid his life down for us. But Dave didn't have to die. He could have run. Uh, but instead, he heard shooting on the second floor after my daughter had been killed. And he ran up the stairs toward the shooting, not away from it. Oh, wow. And he missed the library where my son Craig was with some of his friends, and there was no escape from the library. That was the killing zone. That's where most of the students would be killed. And he confronted the two boys. He had no way to defend himself. And he confronted the two boys and begged them to drop their weapons. And uh, when they refused to do that, he turned. They shot him in the back. He stumbled into a classroom where he bled to death over the next few hours. Wow. And uh, the classroom that he stumbled into was the science lab. It was the only uh, room in the whole school where there was a human skull. Wow. And Jesus laid his life down wow. for his students. Mm. And he was brutally wounded in the back. Oh, wow. He died on the cross. And uh, Calvary is also called Golgotha, which means the place of a human skull. Wow. Wow. Skull. wow. So those are just a couple of the simple parallels. Uh, most of the children killed at Columbine have biblical names. Wow. And uh, there's a lot more detail than that. But uh, it was such a shock to us. I, as I raced over to the school in my truck, I turned on the radio, and an announcer was sobbing and saying that up to 30 had been shot and killed. And uh, I was doing the math in my head, uh, realizing I had uh, a nephew and a niece and a son and a daughter, four students at that school, and I was thinking the odds are very slim that, that any of my children or my brother's children would be victims. But uh, when I got close to the school, they redirected us to a, an elementary school, and they were bringing busloads of students in from Columbine, the survivors. And uh, we waited and waited. I, I, I stood on top of a fence and looked in the windows as every bus pulled in. Uh, we heard from my son, Craig, and uh but we hadn't heard from rachel and i watched as every student got off every bus and this dragged on into the afternoon wow. and at one point i thought i saw her i was all excited and then a, a little girl got off that looked a lot like her and we started calling the hospitals and when your only hope is that your child may have been wounded and then be in a hospital then you know you're desperate yeah, yeah. and uh, when the last child got off the last bus uh, we began to realize that we may have lost Rachel. And it wasn't until noon the next day that we got official word. So we had 24 hours, over 24 hours, where we, had, we didn't know whether she was alive or dead. And uh, that waiting period was the most agonizing day of my life. Oh, I so bet. It's, it's worse to not know than to know. I bet. When I, when I saw this story, um, I have a daughter. She's not quite a teenager yet. But I, I was just imagining, you know, my daughter in this type of situation. And and it was just, I, I mean, it just like breaks your heart to even just even think those thoughts. To, but to actually experience that and go through with it, I, I, I have nothing to compare that to. I mean, I don't even know what that pain would even be like. Sometimes that I get a phone call from the national media, uh, and I do every time there's a school shooting. The minute I hear it's CNN or Fox News or... MSNBC, I, I know that there's been another school shooting. I usually know it right. before the public knows it. Wow. And uh, the heart always sinks. And I, I feel, of course, for the victims, but also feel very deeply for the parents because I do understand what they're going through. And it's a, it's a horrible situation. My son, Craig, was in the library, which became the killing zone. And he was with two of his close friends. And the shooters came into the room and open fire and uh, Craig, my son Craig and his two buddies dove underneath the table. And uh, eventually they came to the table where Craig and his friends were. 
and they shot and killed his two friends. My son lay there covered in the blood of his two friends, not knowing that his sister had just been killed outside the mm. school. Wow. And uh, he knew that he was going to die. He looked down the barrel with two guns aimed at his head, and he knew that his life was over. And a split second before they pulled the trigger, the alarm system went off from smoke in the room, and it distracted the two boys. They never came back to the table where Craig was at, or I would have lost two of my children that day at Columbine. Oh, wow. 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 You know, um, God is, is, is merciful, even in a situation like this. Um, tell us a little bit about Rachel. Where, where, where was she in her life leading up to this experience? Um, what, what, what was kind of her mindset? And, um, you know, there were some connections that you then later found out by reading her journal and, and having some pictures and things. Tell us a little bit about where Rachel was at um, at the time of this experience. Well, Rachel was always one of those children that she loved to pick up a stray dog or a stray cat and bring them home. Mm -hmm. She had a tender heart, and uh, she was my middle child. I have two older daughters and two younger sons. And Rachel was, the whole family knew that she was just, she was the fixer. She always wanted to fix things that were broken in people's lives. And, and she had that reputation at school. For example, uh, at school, she refused to set with any one clique. Mm. She had a reputation for setting with different groups almost every day. Wow. Wow. Sometimes she would isolate a loner, someone that always sat by themselves, and she would go set with them. Mm. And uh, today in our programming, we've reached over 28 million students over the last 21 years. And we create what's called Friends of Rachel Clubs in our schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, those clubs, one of the things they do is they purposefully... Uh, commit on one day of the week to set with people they don't normally set with. Wow. Especially awesome. if there's a new student at school, uh, the four club will assign five or six students to go meet that student and be with them throughout the school day, set with them at lunchtime and make them feel welcome. Wow. But That's Rachel awesome. did that. She was, uh, she had, she had had an experience with the Lord uh, at around age 12 that was very powerful in her life. But it wasn't until she was 16, she kind of, you know, was a typical teenager from 13 to 16. But at 16 years old, a year before she died, she began to sense and feel some pretty uh, amazing things in her heart. Lord, I'm sorry for everything that I've done. Jesus, I ask you to forgive me and I ask you to come into my life. Father, use me to be a light to the world. And she began to write about them. She had kept a diary for a number of years. In fact, we have six of her diaries that she left with us. But a year to the day before she died, one year to the day, April 20th, 1999 was the day she died. On April 20th, 1998, she wrote in her diary and she said, it's like I have a heavy heart. And there's something in me that makes me want to cry. I don't know what it is. She said, things have changed. Now that I've begun to walk my talk, some of my friends make fun of me. But you know what? I'm not ashamed of the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm going to let my light shine. And if my, if my friends have to become my enemies, for me to be with my best friend Jesus, mm -hmm. that's all right with me. Wow. And exactly one year later, uh, one of her friends was one that shot one of the two that shot her uh had become her enemy mm. and caused her to go to be with her best friend jesus wow and she wrote a lot of things that she in that last year in her diaries she wrote things like god i want you to use me and i want you to use me now mm. she had a sense of urgency in her life like i don't want to wait mm. it has to be now mm -hmm. and we have heard story after story after story from young people whose lives she touched and changed. And uh, I was just thinking the other day, uh, you know, we're in such a political upheaval in our nation and we're there's so much animosity between the left and the right, the conservative, the liberal. And, uh, and yet two or three of the key figures in politics today were influenced by Rachel. Wow. Mm -hmm. One of them was Kaylee McEnany, who is the chief White House correspondent under President Trump. And Kaylee called us several years ago and uh, ended up being on our board of directors. She had to resign when she became the chief correspondent 
uh, the spokesperson for the White House. But uh, she said that in, in middle school, Rachel's story changed her life. Oh. And all the way through Harvard School, every thesis that she did was on Rachel. Oh, wow. wow. And then uh, on the other side of the aisle, uh, uh, Camellia's, Harris's right-hand man is uh, Sergio uh, uh, Gonzalez, who, Garcia, I'm sorry, Sergio Ga Garcia, who uh, was a friend of Rachel's in high school. He was a young man that, that was gay, and uh, Rachel accepted him as a human being. She didn't she didn't reject him like others had. And mm. he never forgot that to this day. He and I are friends on Facebook, even though we have different political viewpoints. Yeah. Right. Uh, Sergio is now an influencer. And then the third one is Charlie Kirk, who uh, has Turning Point USA. Charlie went through Rachel's Challenge wow. and, uh, when he was in high school and told me that it had a huge impact on his life and helped guide the direction for his life. So Rachel is still having an impact yes, on both is. sides of the aisle. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, I think that is so beautiful that, you know, something that easily could just, you, you your life would just fall apart. As a parent, it just seems like your life would would cease to be interesting or, or exciting or anything like this. But yet something like this has happened. And look at the amount of people now that have been influenced or affected or, you know, to... to turn this tragedy into something beautiful like this, I think is just amazing. And, and that there is light at the end of the tunnel, you know? Well, I want Absolutely. to- and, and, uh, I'm not taking away from the fact that I was in deep grief yes. and sorrow for a number of months. And, uh, there's a time to weep and there's a time to rejoice. Yeah, that's right. As Ecclesiastes says, and, uh, we went through a time of mourning, but we also, uh, knew that joy was coming in the morning. Yeah. And that eventually happened. And but I wanted to share with you just how impactful your daughter still has. Like you were saying, I I was 16 when this happened, and I was in a very dark place. I mean, very dark. Like, I was where those shooters were. I was wearing all black. I was listening to Marilyn Manson. It was my favorite band. And when it happened, it, it, it didn't affect me at all. I was so numb that even when 9-11 happened, I, I'm ashamed to say, like, I walked in and my mom was watching the news and crying seeing people fall down out of a building and it just had nothing on me i i just walked to my room like whatever and i was like in such a dark place and it wasn't until literally like two months ago that i watched this movie that came out like four years ago and all this like brought back so much of my past and and it just i was in tears the whole time and when i finished watching it I looked up all the interviews, I watched your sermon, and I just spent hours sobbing and just like, she was in such an amazing spot, like as a 17 year old girl saying, I want this now, I want this now, where so many other teens are like, I got my whole life ahead of me. I can do that when I'm older. That was my thought when I, even when I started accepting that Christ was real, I was like, well, you know, I can, I can fully commit on my deathbed, you know, I want to live my life. But Rachel wasn't like that. She wanted to make a change now, and she wanted to, um, you know, change the world with love and compassion, and yes. and and that would, you know, have an impact on these these guys that did this were bullied all their life, or or you know at least in high school or whatever. It's such an important message for today because you think of what a teenager's world is existing of right now. I mean, it is like centered around self-centeredness, selfishness selfies everywhere and look at me and look at what I'm doing mm -hmm. and to hear a story of a 17 year old that says though I lose my friends yeah. and nobody wants anything to do with me I'd rather stay true to the line of my best friend Jesus and that's all that matters to me I mean that is a refreshing story for yeah, me to hear it's powerful man it's powerful I, I like how um, you're encouraging young people to flip the model you know I remember my family moved around a lot when I was young and I was always the new kid and being the new kid in school is a terrible thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're, nobody wants to talk to you. Nobody wants to get to know you. I think between fourth grade and sixth grade, I was in like 10 different schools. Yeah. You can't make friends with anyone. And so, um, you know, there were very few people that I can remember 
who actually would do something like Rachel was doing and reaching out and trying to make you feel comfortable and welcomed and accepted. So I appreciate that you are uh, encouraging so many young people today to, to do that. Um, I remember watching one of your interviews and you had talked about how um, Rachel really wanted to be a, uh, she wanted to be a movie star and at the same time she wanted to be um, a, missionary. Um, a missionary. Yeah, and just what a, what a dichotomy of a world there. Mm -hmm. and, and please share with us how, how that actually came true. Well, it did come true because uh, a movie was made about her life, uh, three television Emmy Awards uh, based on her story. So in that sense, how many, how many stars win three Emmy Awards? You know? yeah. and, uh, and at the same time, she has become a missionary because so her nice. story and her life has changed the lives of, of literally millions of people. Uh, many of them have become uh, believers because of Rachel's story. We, we got an email from a young lady who attended uh, one of our assemblies in a school and she went out and bought a book called Rachel's Tears about my daughter. Mm -hmm. And she bought copies for her whole softball team. And she emailed us and said that because of that book, her whole softball team uh, came to know the Lord. Wow. wow. So, wow. You know, it's, it's, we, we hear stories like that all the time. One of the funny stories, we don't, uh, we don't screen our speakers. We have up to 50 presenters each year. And we don't screen them by religion. They, we're, we're a non-religious non-political organization but uh one of them but we do train them we learn we train them to think spiritually and speak secularly mm -hmm. which is really important in today's culture you can't go around spouting scriptures with young people though yeah. they're immediately going to be turned off yeah. but you can take any verse in the bible and reword it and if there's truth there it's going to resonate in their spirit like jesus parables yes absolutely and so this young man came into our office one day and he said, he was laughing. He said, uh, I had the strangest thing happen to me today or yesterday when I was speaking at a school. He said, um, a lady came up with tears streaming down her face. This was in the evening event because we do uh, a morning assembly. We do a training in the afternoon and we do an evening event with parents. And this was a parent who came up to him and uh, tears streaming down her face and she hugged him. And she said, I want you to know that you have renewed my faith in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and he said, as a Jewish believer, wow. I never dreamed that I would be helping people renew their Christian faith. <laughs> right. wow. That's amazing. Wow. wow. Also, not just what's going on now, but in your daughter's <laughs> death brought so many people to the Lord. And I heard a specific story I want to bring up. But a lot of people say, you know, why would God let this happen? And I've in the past mentioned you know, you don't know when God allows somebody to die that many people get saved at that funeral. God is looking at the bigger picture and he's like, if a thousand people come to the Lord because of this one funeral, I'm going to allow it. <coughs> and when you, on uh, your sermon, you mentioned that when CNN or C-SPAN, whichever was, was airing her funeral, how it had more eyes on it than Princess Diana's funeral. And you mentioned a man who was about to kill himself. Will you share that? Yes, we, we received uh, numerous emails, phone calls, letters from people who actually gave their heart to the Lord at her funeral all over the world because CNN uh, uh, asked if they could broadcast the funeral. We gave them permission to, and uh, it was the largest viewing audience they had ever had in their history wow. up to that point. Wow. And uh, we, we received so many letters and phone calls and emails. I don't remember the specific one that you're mentioning, mm. but uh, there were people who were planning to commit suicide who, in fact, one of the stories shortly after she died, the book came out that, uh, that I co-authored called Rachel's Tears. Mm -hmm. And uh, a young girl, <clears throat> a young lady uh, contacted us and told us that she picked up the book. It was lying on a table in a bookstore. And she said, I walked into the bookstore an atheist, and I walked out a Christian. Praise the Lord. Wow. wow. I put this book lying on the table. I sat down and read the whole book without getting up. And I gave my heart to the Lord at the, on the last chapter. That's a true missionary and, uh, right we, there. You just heard so many stories like that. Wow. So wow. I, I want to, to not skip over this. 
um, Rachel's tears. Can you share a little bit about, um, you know, some of the drawings that she had that you came across later, um, specifically the rose with the tears on it, and and give our audience a little backstory on that. Yeah, uh, about six to eight weeks after Rachel's funeral, I got a phone call from uh, a gentleman by the name of Frank who lived in Ohio, still does. And uh, Frank told me that uh, he said, Mr. Scott, you don't know me. We've never met. <clears throat> but he said, I've had, uh, he said, occasionally I have a dream that I feel like the Lord gives me and it always seems to come true. And he said, I've had a reoccurring dream about your daughter and her eyes. And I've had the same dream for over a week, night after night. Mm -hmm. And I've shared it with my family and some of my employees. And he said, in the dream, I see your daughter's eyes. And there's a trickle of tears falling from Rachel's eyes. And the tears are watering something that's growing out of the ground. There's life coming out of the ground from her tears. And uh, he said, I just had to call and find out if that meant anything to you or your family. And I told him, no, it didn't. And uh, he apologized. He said, I'm sorry for calling you. I know you're still grieving. But he said, would you please write my name and phone number down? And if it ever means anything to any family member, uh, would you give me a call? And so I'm so glad I wrote his number down. I did. Hmm. And I put it in my desk drawer and pretty much forgot about it. But exactly one week later, I got a phone call from the sheriff's department. And they said, we have your daughter's backpack ready for you to pick up. There were three bullet holes through her backpack, and they had kept it as evidence as to which bullets had done what. And uh, so I rushed over to get it and I took it to my car and I opened up her backpack and took out uh, some of her school books. And there in the bottom was her final diary. And like any parent, I wanted to know the last thing Rachel had written before she died. And so I turned to the last page of her diary and uh, expecting to read something that she had written. But instead I was looking at this picture yeah. And it's a picture of her eyes. There's a trickle of tears falling from her eyes. And the tears turn dark just before they hit a rose, which mm -hmm. is America's national flower. And uh, I counted the clear teardrops. There were 13 of them. And within two hours of Rachel drawing that picture, 13 people have been murdered at Columbine, a teacher and 12 students. Wow. Wow. And uh, when the, the drops hit the rose, they turned to dark drops that either look like blood drops or seeds. And for years, I said that those were blood drops. But I was speaking at a large conference of educators, and a teacher came up to me afterwards and said, I don't think those are blood drops. I think they're seeds. Mm -hmm. Because the man said he saw something growing out of the ground. Mm -hmm. And so I changed my story. Uh -huh. <laughs> because like seeds. The man that called you was a grow. was a form. But the ironic thing is, uh, the uh, rose was growing out of a columbine flower, mm. and the columbine flower is the state Colorado state flower and the name of the high school. Wow! wow. So you have the America. You have America's national flower growing out of the Colorado state flower, which happens to be the name of the school. And by the way, the word columbine means dove-like. It means like a dove. The mm -hmm. same description used for the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like a dove. Another one of those parallels. But uh, that's not the end of the story because I was speaking at the Old Country Store, which is the prototype for all the Cracker Barrels in America. Oh, wow. It's in Jackson, Tennessee. And uh, the owners of the store uh, uh, had a beautiful cabin they put me in. It's a cabin they were good friends with. Uh, the Bush family, President Bush, and that's where he stayed when he would go fishing with them there. And I uh, got to stay in this cabin by myself. I was wishing my wife was with me because it was a gorgeous place and it was right on a lake. But uh, I spoke behind the old country store. They had made a platform and uh, tens of thousands of people literally wow. were there. It was a massive sea of people and churches from all over the area had brought their folding chairs they had a big PA system outdoors. And I, I told this story for the first time and I didn't have any props. I didn't have any pictures. I couldn't show them the picture. 
When I finished telling the story, there was a little girl about Rachel's age sitting over to my left, right near the front, who just started sobbing. I mean, mm. loudly sobbing. And uh, people were emotional back then because it was shortly after the tragedy. And I was used to that. But uh, I took note of her because she was just heaving. Mm. And when I finished speaking, she came up to me with her Bible open. And she said, Mr. Scott, I was reading from the book of Jeremiah three nights ago. And the Lord laid on my heart that the man who was coming to speak was supposed to read these verses. Hmm. Wow. She said, I didn't know your daughter's name. I didn't know anything about you other than that you had lost your daughter at Columbine. And she said, now I understand why you're supposed to read this. Hmm. She handed me her Bible and it was open to the passage that said, a loud voice was heard in Rama, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because oh. her children are no more. Oh. I said to the Lord, stop your weeping dry your tears for your work shall be rewarded mm -hmm. and I shall return the children from the land of captivity and bring them back to their own inheritance. Wow. That day wow. I knew in my spirit what my mission was for the rest of my life. Wow. I'll wow. bring children out of captivity and bring them back to a place of their true inheritance to find out who they really yeah. are, wow. not who they want to be or who they think they are, or who other people say they are, right. but to get them out of the ego self, out of the self-centeredness, and into the spirit being that they are. Mm. Right. And that's been our mission. Right. And that's where you will find true happiness, true peace. Yeah. When you're others focused, yeah. you, you you care about those around you. You know, like like in the film they, they often showed one of the, the schoolmates that, that Rachel had that was, you know, kind of disliked by everybody and he was kind of odd looking and, and you know, to, to go to those people and say, hey, what are you doing this weekend? Yeah. Hey, Austin. How's it going? Going to chemistry. You want to do something this weekend? Uh, with who? With me. And go like see a movie or something Friday. We we go on a a real date. Yeah, sure. Have you ever been on one? Oh yeah, lots of them. I didn't know you're such a player. With my mom. Got it. I'm sorry, I'm not your mom. You're prettier. <laughs> you are a player. You're Friday, Austin. You know, I'd like to hang out with you and spend my time with you. I mean, those little interactions speak volumes to to those people. You could change someone's life simply by yeah. that, you know, recognition and, and saying, you know, I, I see you and I care about you. And yeah. how can I make your life a little bit better? And to try to get young people to understand that concept is is our main mission on our on our show as well. So um, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I do have one question. Um, what about the two gentlemen that did this? Did you ever have any interaction with their parents? I mean, I want to. I want to know what 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 is it like to forgive somebody that took away your daughter? Um, you know, what was that process going for in your life? Well, fortunately for me, I had great mentors. Uh, I had a, a gentleman in my life by the name of Norman Grubb. He was a best-selling Christian Christian author back in the nineteen. 30s and 40s, believe it or not. Hmm. He was a World War I veteran. He fought for the British Army in World War I. He won a number of medals for valor. And uh, Norman was the, uh, the son-in-law to a man by the name of C.T. Studd, who was one of the first missionaries wow. to Africa. Yeah. And uh, he also was a close friend to Reese Howes and wrote the story of a man by the name of Reese Howes, who was an intercessor in uh, Wales and, bought, and helped to bring about the Wales Revival. Norman was uh, responsible for helping start the presidential prayer breakfast uh, when President Eisenhower was president. And he was a, uh, a counselor to both Eisenhower and President Jimmy Carter, spiritual counselor to both of them. And Norman taught me something that I never forgot. One day we were talking, he had a British accent, and he said, Daryl, if you will learn to be a see-thrower mm. and not a look at her, Mm. Life will have purpose and meaning. If you'll learn to see through your circumstances and not at them, you'll find the hand of God at work no matter what the circumstances are. 
He said, if you'll learn to see through people mm -hmm. to their heart and not look at them, their exterior, then you will know how to deal with them. Mm -hmm. And Rachel knew that principle. In fact, she wrote about it. Mm -hmm. uh, she wrote about the illusions in life in one of her writings, and she copied something that I had taught. She said, we talk about sunsets and sunrises, but there is no such thing as a sunset or a sunrise. Those are illusions. Mm -hmm. There's only earth turns. Mm -hmm. But sunrise and sunset sound so much more romantic. Mm -hmm. And even though we know that there's no rising of the sun and setting of the sun, before, um, before you know, 14th, 14th century, everybody believed that the sun rose and set. And uh, so it wasn't until the telescope that we began to realize that the earth revolves around the sun, not vice versa. Mm -hmm. So she wrote about the fact that we live in a world of illusions and we have to learn to see through and not look at. Mm -hmm. So when the tragedy occurred, we had to practice that. And it was really tough to practice being a see-through-er mm -hmm. when we first lost Rachel. But one of the first television interviews I did was with Maria Shriver. And uh, she grabbed us. Uh, we were out near Rachel's car, which was still at the school. And uh, she said, Mr. Scott, uh, how do you feel about the parents of the boys who did this? And I said, well, our family understands the principle of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And we've chosen to forgive. Wow. And when I said that, her head literally jerked back. We still wow. have that video. Wow. Hmm. And uh, she said, how can you possibly forgive? And I said, well, I can't possibly forgive. <laughs> That's right. It's a divine attribute, not a human That's attribute. Right. That's right. And it's something that I had to yield to in order for it to happen. Yeah. Well, Larry King, who just died mm -hmm. yesterday, oh, wow. or day before yesterday, saw that interview, oh, wow. and he invited me to come on his program with Billy Graham. And the two of us talked for 30 minutes about forgiveness. Oh, wow. And then Tom Brokaw saw that interview, and he invited me to come on his show for a 15 minute interview just on the topic of forgiveness. Wow. So that topic alone was heard by the whole world yeah. through those two television shows on the fact that you can forgive no matter how terrible the situation. And forgiveness, um, I pointed out, and I do a whole training on forgiveness for educators, and uh, we'll have uh, 2,000 educators in a room. And it's like a revival takes place. They're in tears. They're hugging each other. They're crying. And I talked to them about uh, the difference between pardon and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. I would not have pardoned Eric and Dylan, mm -hmm. but I could not not forgive them. Right. Forgiveness is for me. That's right. right. Pardon has to do with judicial procedure. Mm -hmm. right. Forgiveness is an issue of the heart. That's right. If they had lived and not committed suicide that day, I would have gone to court having forgiven them, and I would have testified against them yeah. so that they could never do it again. That's right. 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 Yeah. So people get those two things mixed up. And they think, well, if I forgive, it means I'm supposed to let the person continue to do what they do forever. Right. Well, that's not always true. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There, that's what consequences sometimes they're for. But yeah, the act of actual forgiving, do, do you feel that a, a weight was lifted off when you actually verbalized those, those forgiveness words and those concepts and really just gave that up to Christ? Do you feel like that, that in itself was a release of the, of the just anger and the frustration that you felt? Or how, how did that? You know, I wish I could say it happened immediately, but it didn't. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel forgiving mm -hmm. when I confessed forgiveness. Mm -hmm. I had to do it over and over and over again. And yeah. it took me to the, to the time when Jesus told his disciples, if your brother offends you, yeah. don't yeah. just forgive him once. Yeah. 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 70 times seven, which yeah. in essence, he was saying, you forgive until it becomes real to you. Yeah. Wow. Right. Yeah. I had to do it over and over and over. And uh, I'm glad I did because it, it was like a slow drip rather than a flood. Yeah. Yes. Amen. I just want to piggyback off of something you said, Daryl, about forgiveness. You know, with with each one of us, God has forgiven each one of us of our sins. Right. Yes. And and just like he forgives us of our sins, he's not asking us to keep doing the same behavior over and over again. In fact, he's telling us to stop, go and mm -hmm. sin no more. Yeah. You know, so I can see that principle illustrated 
through how Christ treated other people on this earth and what he calls each one of us to do every single day. John wrote and he said that he shed his blood not for our sins only, mm -hmm. but for the sins of the whole world. That's yeah, right. yeah. And it, and it says, God who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers, that's in 1 Timothy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Salvation has already taken place for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the good news is you're already saved. Mm -hmm. Salvation took place at Calvary. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men into me. Mm -hmm. As by the, the offense of the one, the disobedience of the one, mm -hmm. the many were made sinners. Mm -hmm. So much more by the mm -hmm. obedience of the one mm -hmm. shall the many righteous. be made righteous. Mm -hmm. So the good news to all unbelievers is, mm -hmm. guess what? You're yeah. already saved. Mm -hmm. And the moment they acknowledge that yep. is when it becomes real for them. So we have practiced that in Mexico. Uh, a friend of mine, Dr. Mark Hanby, who's a one of the best preachers I've ever heard in my life, uh, he and I go to, to uh, Guadalajara quite often, and he led a family of atheists to the Lord there. And uh, over the last three years, that family, without a church building, have led, as a result of that impact, over 30,000 new believers. Wow. And I message to every one of them, and they meet by the hundreds every weekend in different cities. Uh, and these are all new people, not the same people. Yeah. New people. And uh, we begin the meet. they begin the meeting. We don't do the meetings. We encourage them to do them. And they begin by saying, how many of you are Baptists? How many are Catholic? How many are Presbyterian? They all raise their hand. How many are atheists? How many are agnostics? And then they say, here's the good news. No matter what your title is, Jesus already saved you. Mm. How many are happy that he saved you? Mm -hmm. And the atheists are raising their hands. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what happened just then? Yeah. They believed. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Our it's job is to accept. believing that it's already done. Yeah. Our job is to accept it's that finished. gift that Christ has given to us. That's, right. yeah. That's, That's our right. job. Yes. Yeah. Daryl, you've made so many amazing points. And um, earlier you talked about the programs that you do and that you don't use the label of bully. Um, and that brought to my mind that saying, hurt people, hurt people, right? Mm -hmm. And it's so easy to hate someone who does something so catastrophic. And it, it takes such a measure of faith to, as you're saying, look through them, seeing God's love for them and then his call for us to love them back, yeah. you know? And yes. um, it brought to mind Romans chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. And it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Have Christ's mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Mm -hmm. For I say, through the grace given unto me, this is Paul talking, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, mm -hmm. but to think soberly according to as God hath dealt with every man the yes. measure of faith. And that was so impactful. You also said that you had to keep verbalizing your forgiveness of these people until it became a reality. Mm. And the thought came, you know, in the silence, there's compromise. Yeah. And mm -hmm. as a church, as we go through these times throughout history, these catastrophic events, two things could happen. It could shake the church to its core, to the to the extent that it crumbles and a lot of people lose faith, or it could actually like light the fire of zeal that we yeah. need to go out and share the love of Christ mm -hmm. and have the Holy Spirit transform people's lives. And it's not just having the, the renewing of your mind inside yourself, you need to verbalize it, not only so it becomes a reality for you, yeah. but to those around you, to let people know that, no, we don't agree with this, but we can see how God's working in this. And it is our part to um, share the love of Christ with those evangelize. all around us, evangelize, right? And also, you know, a as a Christian, you know, you don't have the promise of tomorrow. I mean, when I hear this story, you know, your daughter was prepared. She was, God was preparing her and she was living her life as if it was her last day. Right. And I believe that is something that we all need to take a, a note on and, and live as if this was our last day. If, if you didn't know that you would wake up tomorrow morning, how would that impact w what you interact with today? Absolutely. Um, if you didn't know, you know that, that you had that guarantee when you walk outside and you see that person struggling on the side of the road or, 
or whatever. How would that change the way that we all interact together? Yeah. And I think that's beautiful that, that Rachel really grasped that concept. And even in her diary was writing in there, um, you know, I don't have much longer to live. I mean, what 17-year-old thinks that? Yeah. yeah. You know, though, I want to I wanna piggyback off what you're saying because it, if, you, if you look at Rachel's story, Rachel, Rachel was at this point where she was having to come to terms with life and making a decision to go one way or the other. And those two gentlemen who did what they did, they were also preparing. Yeah. And you have a preparation for two entirely different realities. That's right. And I think that's what everybody needs to come to terms with in their own life is what reality are you preparing for? Right. Are you preparing for the reality that you're going to uh, submit to Christ and love everybody? Or are you going to prepare for the reality where you reject his love and, and your life goes, you know, a terrible direction. That, that's a great point because then you look at the avenues of preparation. Mm -hmm. Someone who is, their desire is to live for Christ. And what was her avenue? She picked up her Bible yeah. and she was writing. So along with that, I, I just, I feel a little bit compelled to make this point. Knowing, knowing what those boys were doing and, and how they were preparing, they, they had an influence of media in their lives that's that right. was helping them to prepare. And they also were reading some ideology that led them down that path. Yeah. And as I look at Daryl here on the screen, I see a number of books in his library. And how these books that he has read has helped him to prepare and become the person he is today. And as our group, we try to herald that uh, message that, you know, what you're putting into your mind affects how you think, it affects mm -hmm. how you see life, and it affects how you are preparing to live. Mm -hmm. And what a powerful testimony in both cases, right, of how that mental preparation led them down a particular path. Yeah. And that preparation doesn't happen overnight. It's not like right. all of a sudden, wham, it's this daily, it was daily um, you know, coming back and learning over the course mm -hmm. of time and, and, and having those actions, seeking out those those um, undesirables mm -hmm. in, in the world's mind, uh, you know, those kids in school and daily doing that, that prepared her for that's, that situation. That's what Paul says, you know, he says, I die daily that was his preparation that's right mm. you know and look at the end result at the end the earthly end result of, of their lives both yeah. died right yeah. but the um, john 10 10 for the thief cometh to steal kill and destroy, destroy. but god comes so he can give life and give it, give more, it more abundantly, abundantly. yes both yeah. were put to rest mm. but both will have very different uh realities when they wake up mm. yeah. yeah well man i can't wait to meet your daughter daryl in heaven and i'm sure you can't wait to get reconnected as well. Thank you so much for, for sharing um, her story with us, for continuing to, to impact people's lives with her. Um, tell our audience, though, a little bit how they can get a hold of you, how they can get a hold of some of your material. You, you had mentioned that there's a movie that was made on her. There's a book that was made. If people want to you know, see some more of, of her story, where can we get in touch with you? Well, uh, on your... Uh... Somebody mentioned the verse from Romans about renewing the mind. And uh, I believe with all my heart that that's a neglected subject mm -hmm. in Christianity. Mm -hmm. And that's where mm -hmm. everything takes place. Mm -hmm. All right. temptation, all mm -hmm. guilt, all judgment, all criticism, all of that mm -hmm. takes place in the mind. Yep. And, uh, Boy, do we have some videos for you. Yeah, brother. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a whole so, channel dedicated to this subject. I wrote a book called Lose Your Mind and find your purpose mm. wow. and, uh, it's based on the scripture where jesus said if you lose your life mm -hmm. and it's a mistranslation in english because the word life there is the word psyche mm. it's the same word mm. used for soul mm. if you yeah. lose your psyche your mind because the mind is a big part of the soul mm -hmm. if you lose your mind for my sake of the gospels you'll find the mind of christ mm -hmm. but uh yeah you can contact me through uh uh, Daryl Scott Books, D A R R E L L S C O T T Books, or Books by Daryl Scott uh, dot com, or Rachel's Challenge, either one. And uh, you can find a lot of videos on Rachel's Challenge and a lot of connection on Daryl Scott Books dot com uh, on some of the books that we've written about her. 
We'll certainly put um, some of the links in the description below. Do you guys have any other yes. final questions? I want to make Candy does. this <laughs> last point. Guys, imagine this from God's perspective, mm -hmm. right? Seeing all angles and having all these moving parts and not just Rachel as a daughter, but father, mother, siblings, mm -hmm. friends, mm -hmm. you know, this expanding out to now people in government and all of these moving parts. And it, it just was laid on my heart that we need to be obedient yeah. mm -hmm. to the Lord. You know, mm -hmm. imagine if that person in Ohio didn't pick up the phone and yeah. call Daryl. And so he could make that mm -hmm. connection that with what dreams. happened in the diary. Like yep. that is just mm -hmm. so yep. impactful from the biggest thing to the smallest thing. We need to be obedient to the Lord and follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And, in and to have that connection. And implicitly trust in God. Absolutely. Even though we cannot see past the grief, mm -hmm. we cannot yes. see past the darkness. Mm -hmm. Something tragic like that happens and you don't understand. It's probably, I mean, you go through a gamut of emotions, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Angry at God. Where were you? What were you doing? Why did you let this happen? But then if you could just implicitly trust God. Exactly. That He has our best interest at heart and that he can take a situation like this and go and win a bunch of souls for the kingdom through this tragedy. It's like no matter what the devil does, he yeah. can't take the upper hand away from God. That's right. God has the last voice and he's just saying, if you trust in me, I can turn this for good. And it's okay if it doesn't make sense. That's the thing. Okay. Sometimes it's not even about us. We just need to do our part and it will create that domino effect to impact someone way down the line. Yeah. You're not on your own understanding. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. right. To all you young people out there that are watching, you guys, uh, are, you're on our hearts. In mm -hmm. fact, when we in this ministry create any piece of content, you are the ones that we are actually thinking of. And when we think about the topics that we want to address, the things that we want to bring up, um, you guys, you guys are the future. And we understand we've been past this teenage uh, college age range. And we understand uh, through experience of what that's like and um, looking back on it from the perspective that we have now, if you put your trust in God, you will have a peace that passes all understanding. And God, when you ask him to direct your path, he will direct your path. That's exactly what he tells us in his word. So get in the habit of saying, God, even though whatever tragedy is happening in my life right now, I'm gonna trust in you. I'm gonna place my whole heart and 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 i'm going to clasp onto you until you bless me just like jacob held on to christ mm -hmm. that is literally what we are called to do and i just hope and pray that you were blessed by today's topic mm -hmm. um leave some comments in the description below oh, yeah. if you guys want to get in touch with daryl um reach out to him talk with him if you want to read his book uh rachel's tears great book um, check this book out and there's also a lot of different productions that have been made about this story and as always thank you guys so much for tuning in we hope that you'll like and share this video and we'll see you again next friday